Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for this webinar is, should there be a clean peak standard? This webinar is a presentation of the RPS Collaborative. Uh, the RPS Collaborative is managed by the Clean Energy States Alliance, also known as CESA. And our host for this webinar is Warren Leon, who is the Executive Director of CESA and who manages the RPS Collaborative. We have an excellent guest speaker with, today, with us today. Uh, before I pass it over to them for our webinar, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. So on your screen, you should see something that looks like your webinar console that appeared when you launched this webinar. The little orange button with an arrow that we've circled there, you can use that to minimize the control panel or expand it if you'd like to view this webinar full screen. I also wanted to alert you to the audio feature on your webinar console. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of this webinar. You can either call in using a telephone or connect using your computer mic and speakers. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions as you think of them throughout the webinar by typing them into the question panel on your webinar console. We will read through your questions as they come in and we will save some time for a Q&A at the end of our presentations. So please type your questions in as you think of them. Don't wait until the very end. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We are going to send out an email within about 24 hours with a link to the webinar recording and a copy of the slides. You can also find those on our website along with all of our previous RPS collaborative webinars. Those are at cisa.org backslash webinars. So with that, I will pass it over to our host for this webinar, Warren Leon. Hey, thank you very much, Samantha. Well, this webinar is being hosted by the Clean Energy States Alliance. We're a national organization of state and other public entities that are working together to advance clean energy, especially in the electricity sector. And you could see logos of most of our members up here on your screen. And one thing we do, if you go to the next slide, is we manage the RPS Collaborative. This is an initiative that's funded by the Energy Foundation and the U.S. Department of Energy, and it provides a forum for state RPS administrators, federal agency representatives, and other stakeholders to share information and ideas about renewable portfolio standards. Uh, we do regular webinars like this one. We produce reports, and we're going to have several reports coming out in the next month or two, and we do an annual summit in Washington, D.C. We also produce a monthly newsletter, and if you want to get on the list to get this free newsletter, which includes announcements of what's going on in the wonderful world of RPS around the country, uh, just Go to our website, cisa.org, and you can sign up. So let's go to the next slide. Today, we're going to be focusing on a idea that has been getting a lot of attention, and we're going to be hearing from one of the people who helped develop this idea and help um, popularize it. It's now being actively considered in Nevada and in California and maybe elsewhere. And the person we'll be hearing from is Lon Uber, who's Senior Director at Stratagen Consultant. In that role, he directs Stratagen's private sector consulting practice, providing independent analysis, strategy, and policy solutions for some of the energy sector's most pressing issues. On behalf of clients, he's involved in many public proceedings across the country, covering such topics as rate design, community solar, energy storage policy, and the design of ratepayer-friendly market structures. Prior to joining Stratagen, Lon worked for a state consumer advocate office for energy-related technology firms in the private sector and at an energy-focused research institute. He's going to have a very interesting presentation. I'm sure you're going to have some questions on it. Type them in. 
as you think of them, and we will have time for questions. Let me turn things over to Lon. Great. Well, thanks a lot for that introduction, Warren. I appreciate it, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to, to share more about this idea and, and to really answer that, that question that this is framed to be. You know, should there be a clean peak standard? And what are the benefits? You know, what are, are some of the, the trade-offs in looking at this? And, and so that's what I'm going to cover today. A little bit of, of background strategy. Uh, it's a consulting firm uh, that works on policy and program design, program implementation strategies, and evaluation and analysis. And my team specifically works closely with regulatory commissions, state governments, and consumer advocates. In fact, this whole idea of the Clean Peak Standard actually started um, uh, in Arizona for uh, our client, which is uh, the Residential Utility Consumer Office. Uh, a branch of the, the executive uh, in, in Arizona. So that's the genesis of actually this, this entire th um, idea. So just taking a step to, you know, back and, and, and looking at what are the trends that are, are really setting the stage for, for the, you know, this idea, right? So let's just look at a few energy sector trends and talk about them and then um, I'll take you sort of through the, the thought process that, that eventually led us to the Clean Peak Standard. So there's a general trend of relatively flat energy use, but increasing peak demand. Um, and, you know, we, we see this on the individual state level. This is, you know, aggregated uh, across the U.S. From, from EIA, but you can start to see some interesting trend lines develop. Why do we care about this? You know what? You know why do we want to look at, at peak demand costs? And this is an example from Massachusetts, where the top 10% of hours account for 40% of the electricity spent in Massachusetts. And and this is common in, in in many states where the highest peak demand hours are really the cost drivers for ratepayers. And I'll get to this this more a little bit later. <clears throat> at the same time, another trend that's happening is we've got renewable energy, especially on the utility scale, that's cheaper and cheaper. You've got two and a half cent wind in, in many parts of the Midwest, and in the Southwest and sunnier states, you have under three cent, under four cent solar energy, and these are prices that are fixed for over 20 years. So those energy prices are pretty tough to beat. Another trend that we're seeing, um, so high RPSs, are starting to see a little bit of, of diminishing returns, especially when the resource mix to meet that RPS is dominated by, you know, maybe, you know, one technology or one or two technologies. And generally, um, you're, you need to have a little bit more of a rebalancing and uh, of, of resources and, and how you start to use those resources. So they have to move from a energy-only type of resource to, to providing a, a few more services to the grid and and with advanced inverters out there and new to and, and new ways of doing things on, on the utility side um, this can easily be done and this is just a slide from the low carbon grid study and in, in California where it looked at a scenario of um, uh, of a almost a type of business as usual um, to get the, the cheapest green electrons without necessarily taking a more holistic approach. And what they found is that when you have a, a bit of a rebalancing and move beyond just energy and introduce a little bit of storage and, and change the market rules, you can have a significant amount of savings both in greenhouse gas emission reduction and ratepayer costs. Um, and, the, and again, from this, this study, um, if, if you rebalance things, you could save over a billion dollars for ratepayers. Um, and, and again, help with that, the, those deep greenhouse gas emission reductions after, you know, you normally would see a plateau in, in, in the marginal uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. So this is another important trend. Um, so uh, just to recap, energy usage is relatively flat, but peak demand is increasing. Most of the costs are actually in those peak hours. Renewable energy is cheaper than ever, and high RPSs are starting to hit some diminishing returns without thinking a little bit more strategically about the deployment. 
Okay. So with, with those trends sort of set up, I want to give a little bit of context um, for Arizona, which again is, is where this, this idea sort of came out from. And, and in Arizona, there's, um, you know, close to California, there's a anticipation of a, a lot of, of potential negative pricing in the future. Uh, APS, a, a large utility in, in Arizona, uh, has, has informed regulators and others that they're already curtailing solar, their solar for um, several consecutive hours for the majority of days in February or March of, of this year. Um, and, and that's pretty significant because it, we're getting really low and to negative pricing already. And 21% of the capacity in Arizona is, is used to serve the top 5% of ours. And then finally, there is a looming possible capacity shutdown with a large coal plant. Um, and then looking at, again, the, the APS load forecast, relatively flat energy use, but uh, again, uh, increase in peak demand growth over the next 15 years. Depending on the scenario, it could lead to three to seven gigawatts of, of new uh, resources. And, and again, this is also dependent on what happens on the customer side. But uh, again, peak demand growth. And what do you need to meet that peak demand growth? Um, usually, you need a, a mix of, of combined cycles and combustion turbines. And this is, uh, this is from the, a the recent APS IRP that shows um, just what's, what's on the horizon uh, for ratepayers, uh, five uh, gigawatts of new natural gas, which represents about seven billion dollars of capital expenditure, and um, annual revenue increases that start out at six hundred million and, and move up from there. So, significant amount of, of new potential builds, and this is what clearly caught the attention of our client uh, in in the state of Arizona. So Arizona, you know, has an RPS, and they're deploying, uh, a, you know, a, a, a pretty decent amount of renewable energy. But of course, um, as as that renewable energy penetration increases, and um, and those resources shift the peak out. And initially, in in the beginning of the RPS, uh, the capacity value of solar was was actually quite high, you know, around 50 percent depending on, on the, the type of solar technology, could even get up to 70% with dual access tracking. But as, um, as, as renewable energy penetration increases, it lowers and, and shifts that peak out. And you can see from this graph, there's a little bit of a, a mismatch there uh, between the, the production profiles of, of solar and that, uh, and that peak uh, load there um, around that 5 p.m. mark. So taking a step back again and just saying, well, if we could, if we could design something new, uh, what would it look like, and what would be the goals that it would be trying to solve? Uh, and really, we we came we came to the the realization that we've got to move beyond just um, the energy and look at other services, other important services that the electric grid needs. And capacity is the next logical service, and there's others beyond that. But um, really, how could we start to move green electrons into uh, green electrons and green capacity, right? And how can we do so in a way that doesn't really reinvent the wheel completely? We can leverage existing policies to accomplish this. And with with that sort of thinking, that's how we got to what we call the Clean Peak Standard where again, it's moving from clean energy to clean energy and capacity. You can add a carve out multiplier or a new target to an existing state RPS, so you don't need a completely new policy infrastructure. And the, the, the goal here is to target the top peak value hours of each month. And it can essentially transform a rec during those time periods to you know, something you can call maybe a clean capacity credit or a flexible capacity credit. I'll get into that a little bit later. The basic design, uh, it, and, and again, it, it takes the same approach from an RPS. A, a traditional RPS would say, oh, well, let's get 30% of retail sales from renewable energy by 2030. A clean peak standard 
would, would say, well, let's get 30% of our peak energy by renewables by 2030, for instance, and it would define a peak period. And how can uh, a clean peak standard work in terms of compliance? Well, just like a traditional RPS that uses racks based on megawatt hours, uh, a clean peak standard would also use megawatt hours. The key here is that the production meter, uh, that data you would really look at, um, in addition to just that overall production, you would look to time of day of that production from those production meters. And as I mentioned before, those racks um, could be transformed into to a new type of, of compliance uh, um, measure. Uh, and in, in this case, in the white paper, we uh, label them clean capacity credits. Okay, implementation considerations. So, you know, the, the key here is really, you know, how do you define your peak window and what are the, the main months that are driving costs for rate payers? In a lot of states, that's the summer. And, and those are those high value hours. And um, in, in looking at what could make up a clean peak standard, there's also the qualifying resources. So what, you know, Obviously, you know, clearly renewables, but are there other resources maybe on the customer side, some DR, some energy on um, peak energy efficiency, distributed generation, and then there's also energy storage. And uh, different considerations if that energy storage is charged from renewables or if it's charged from the grid, which could be a mix of renewables or not. And so in the paper, we contemplate uh, differential treatment depending on, on what charges that energy storage. And I think, you know, really one of the key things is, well, how do we actually set that, that peak window? So, you know, assuming that the summer is our target, what do we look to when, you know, when we establish this? And um, really in, in states that have already made a lot of progress res with renewables, you're looking at the net peak load. Or as anyone familiar with the, the duck curve in California, that you're basically targeting, targeting the head of the duck. And this graph just illustrates on the bottom there the percentage of, of renewables on the system. And this is just an illustrative example. Um, and you can see the renewables start to sort of fall off during the net, that new net load peak. And so that gross load that used to hit an hour 15 or 16 has shifted now to uh, you know around an hour 20 time frame. And then compliance would actually be based on your gross peak load during that net load peak time frame. And so you can, again, see here in, in a hypothetical, your CPS target, you know, maybe is, is 50% or 40%. Your current renewable is around 13%. And that's measured against that, um, that gross load during the net load time frame. Just a few other considerations is that once you set that initial four hour peak window, say, you know, assuming it's four hours and many studies show that four hours captures most of the capacity need for, for markets um, and a, a lot of uh, capacity products in, in um, ISOs and in, um, in RTOs are around four hours. But once you set that initial window, it stays there to avoid any type of, of snapback, even as that net load shifts out. And this also brings scalability to a CPS so that it can follow um, that, that peak demand as, as, it, as it moves out. Oops, sorry about that. Okay. So this, uh, for, for summer, I wanted to give an example of, of some modeling. This is um, this is a, a California example um, that uh, shows how uh, a, a clean peak standard can, can start charging when there's times of, of abundant renewables and discharge during those peak time frames. So this is a 40% clean peak standard with a four hour peak time window. And you can see how it really targets um, that, that, you know, what, they labeled the head of the duck there. So that's for 
summer months, and there's also consideration for non-summer months, of course. And this is a heat map that illustrates high value hours throughout the year. And you can see that the Clean Peak standard is really laser-like focused on, on those you know, later summer peak hours uh, for this particular system. But there's also um, hours there in the winter in the morning, as you can see there in, in red. Um, so how do you, you know, how do you target those hours? How do you make sure that you've got these assets that are really worked year round? And the answer is, is really publishing um, a type of heat map like this one that shows those, those high value hours during non-summer months and has the same type of, of compliance target uh, for those high value hours. And here's just an, another illustration of, of um, how these, uh, these hours can be formed and the different just load profiles. Now this is from Arizona. You can see uh, on the top there, those are summer peaking hours, you know, really high um, usage there and, and focused on those summer months towards the evening. The, the map, though, for winter looks completely different, as you can see on the bottom. And so you would have a, um, you would know what hours are high value and select your windows accordingly for the non-summer months, and you would have your compliance for those months be based on, on those hours, and, um, and again, still retain your summer peak hours. So, this concept, again, um, introduced as a white paper in Arizona where there's a current proceeding underway. And uh, the idea, though, also spread to, to California where there's legislation uh, that, that's considering this. And, um, the, you know, clearly California and Arizona are in different positions right now. Uh, Arizona's RPS is 15% by 2025. California is a bit more aggressive than that. And so there's different needs at the system, but uh, from our view, a, a clean peak standard can easily be adapted to, um, to these new uh, demands and, and new system dynamics. And this is just, you know, again, the infamous duck curve that will be changing, and they've now labeled it Duckzilla coming up. And so we'll see where, where, uh, where it goes, but there's going to be a revised duck curve coming out soon. Um, that's going to have steeper ramps and a, and a deeper belly. Um, and, and so what that does is it really drives the need for more flexible capacity. And this, not, this isn't to say that California won't eventually also need peak summer capacity. There's a lot of retirements that are happening, both in terms of, of nuclear power plants, but also once through cooling. There's still some peak demand load growth out there. This is a chart from the ISO. Um, and then there's also just certain market dynamics that are happening out there um, that uh, are causing some economic retirements of gas. So um, again, it, it, it will still help with California's peak demand needs in the summer, but the focus is really on flexibility too for non-summer months in California. And you know, this is really needed because um, I think some of the initial modeling in California really focused on hourly modeling and perhaps it would have been better served to have sub-hourly modeling because what, what system planners have found out is that we're far ahead of, of schedule in terms of some of the projections. So the, um, some of the, the high ramping needs are, are coming about four hours early than originally estimated. And California hit its first 15 gigawatt ramp um, just this year. I, I, I believe in February. So that's that's almost like taking Arizona from completely off to 100% peak within just a few hours, just to give that type of perspective. That's, that's a huge amount of, of resources to, to come online in such a short time. And this is an illustration of, of California through our modeling um, of, of that, that springtime ramp in 2030 when you have a 50% RPS and you also have a high amount of distributed renewables that don't count towards that, uh, that RPS. And you can see you've got a you know, 20 plus gigawatt ramp there within a few hours. So how would a clean peak standard help that? Um, well, using what I call dumb charging, which is not optimized necessarily for grid benefit, it's just a simple 
we're going to charge when there's negative pricing or curtailment and then discharge evenly through that peak window. Um, you can see that it reduces the ramp from around 23 gigawatts to 13 gigawatts, and this is a, a 40 percent clean peak standard. So a significant amount of, of um, reduction uh, just from, again, a, sort of a dumb charging mode. So there's a, there's a few other implementation details to consider um, with capacity because, again, this isn't, we're moving beyond just that, that energy must take construct. Um, there could also be locational considerations. So think LA Basin, for example, where you're, you, know, you had a, a nuclear power plant go out and um, you've got a really constrained load pocket. There could be um, uh, multipliers or separate um, focus on those types of, of locational capacity constraints. Um, and I think another really important piece of this is, is the, <coughs> excuse me, the cost containment. And again, this was written from, you know, for the, a consumer advocate agency in Arizona, and this was really, the focus was how to reduce those peak demand costs that are coming on the horizon. Um, and it wouldn't do any good if we were paying more than what the status quo scenario projects, right? So really having some cost containment in here to ensure that the resources brought online won't cost anything more than that next marginal resource. So in Arizona, that's a new aero derivative uh, CT, for instance. So that sort of sets that bar where uh, those clean capacity credits, which could be tradable, or you know procurement decisions from from utilities to meet this you know this obligation, you, you can't. It, it wouldn't cost anything more than what's already on the margin in, in terms of conventional assets. The other thing to consider is your the peak time window of this. Uh, it, you know, you you want to make sure that it uh, fully addresses your system need. And if it's a, a long type of a peak, maybe because you're in a basin and, and have a heat island effect, um, you, you know, if there's possibilities to separate into to two compliance buckets and have two different four-hour time periods, for instance. So just this gets a little bit advanced, and I don't want to go into it too detailed, but just to say that there has to be some flexibility built in to make sure that you're actually reducing capacity costs for ratepayers, and, and you're doing so in a cost-effective manner. All right, so to the question that this webinar presented, should there be a clean peak standard? So again, bringing, going back to those trends, load growth has been relatively flat, and, and as any utility planner would say, load growth can cover a lot of sins, right? And with flat load growth, you really can expose um, certain costs to, to your rate pairs because you don't have that growth to really ab absorb um, system costs. And what's really happened is the, the low natural gas prices have masked um, uh, certain of the certain costs that normally would be really apparent. So um, that flat load growth uh, you know, is one thing, but um, with the the recent you know steep drop in natural gas prices, energy prices have now come to be really low, and and again, that's also partly due to renewables being so cheap on the utility scale side of things. So that that has been the the temporary absolver of some of the cost drivers. But as anyone knows, and in, in this chart, you know, you can you know you can imply from this. Uh, we don't know what future fuel prices could be, you know, natural gas prices. It, it, they could stay low for a really long time, uh, given some of, of the recent advances in, in, um, in, in fracking, but you just don't know. And if those fuel prices were to increase, along with peak demand increases in, that are driving capacity costs, you could really start to, to see uh, rate payers uh, be impacted by um, by those those two trends coming together, and and again on the on the capacity side of things, the EIA projects a significant am amount of new peaking power plants to be built in the U.S. Be, before 2026, and these peaking power plants really only run two to seven percent of the year. So this again can be a pretty big cost driver for ratepayers, where you're paying for assets that 
are really only there um, for a, a small portion of the hours in, in the year. Um, so, you know, I like to give the analogy of, of a parking lot where you've got maybe a, a Halloween store, for instance, and you want to size your parking lot to handle that Halloween traffic, but the rest of the year is just sitting there idle, right? And you've paid a lot to have that that parking garage or that that par all those parking spaces, but they're really underutilized except for that peak time period uh, in October. So what this what this basically does, the Clean Peak standards, is it says, well, let's figure out a way to use clean energy resources and let's figure out a way to use them all year round. And again, reducing those peak costs uh, can save ratepayers a lot of money. So in, in this, uh, in the bottom of this slide, you'll see uh, from an ISO New England report uh, where you know just spending a dollar can can say can translate into over three dollars of savings for ratepayers. And here's an example from New York. Again, same type of findings where the top hundred hours you know, drive over $1.7 billion of, of cost. And, and you've got just idle infrastructure there that's just waiting for those, those peak hours, which you, you, know, you absolutely critically need to meet to, in order to avoid any type of, of reliability situation. So one thing that has, has really been an interesting development has been the advent of, of DC coupled batteries to large scale uh, renewables. And um, the, the technological um, advance here has, has led to a lot of different benefits. And this is just a uh, sort of illustrated example of uh, some of the, um, the benefits of DC versus AC coupled uh, storage to renewable um, from DynaPower, I believe. Um, and you can see that with with DC coupled batteries, for instance, you've you've got um, you're capturing some of of the the clipped energy due to inverter sizing. You're helping with um, the low low voltage startup requirements with the inverter, and it's and again you can um, with the batteries uh, obtain the 30% ITC, and this has led to a significant drop in solar plus storage costs. I, I'm citing this this latest one from KIUC in Hawaii, where relatively, you know, small installation, at least by mainland standards, and of course the cost of doing business is, in Hawaii is never cheap. But this was an 11 cent, uh, I believe, uh, PPA for five hours of storage. So again, more than probably most states would need. You know, think in the three to four mark. So five hours of storage. 11 cents and what we're hearing from utilities and suppliers is that for a larger scale installation around 100 megawatts you can make you can be in the 4.5 to 5 cents a kilowatt hour for uh, solar energy with um, four hours of, of energy storage and at that cost that's very attractive and competitive to more traditional peaking forms of energy um, so I want to just close out you know, by saying a few things on, on the clean peak. Clearly, I think it's a yes to the question of should we have a clean peak standard. And it's important to know that, although I give you examples from Arizona and California, a clean peak standard can apply uh, to all states and in different levels of, of renewable penetration. So early on, just, you know, a, say, south-facing solar or certain wind technology will be able to hit on peak. And perhaps you need tracking um, or uh, west facing, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but in early on in states, um, it doesn't require energy storage by any means or any type of advanced technology. Um, but it's important to set up those price signals to, to ensure that we are taking the right type of balancing in terms of renewable energy assets like that low carbon grid study. Um, so, you know, think of it in terms of if a utility had a choice of a three cent PPA or a four and a half cent PPA, that three cent PPA was just energy only during the midday, and the 4.5 cent was four hours of energy storage. Under current RPS structures, the utility would most likely go to the three cent, three cent PPA, even though possibly the four and a half cent solar plus storage 
um, PPA or, or you know, facility could bestow greater ratepayer benefits. And so what the Clean Peak standard tries to do is, is send those price signals. And if you do it right, it doesn't present any trade-off to ratepayers, especially when there's combustion turbines or other peaking assets on the margin. Um, you, you, you gain fuel diversity, you gain capacity diversity, and you do so in a way where ratepayers are held harmless and can only benefit. So that's why I think a clean peak standard is needed. And uh, I'll drop it off there to start with questions. And this is just a, um, a, a link to the, the full white paper that, that we wrote for on behalf of the Arizona Consumer Advocate Office. Um, and then just a, a little bit of a, a plug there if, if you want to learn more on, on what, what's going on with California. I'm speaking on the clean peak standard um, at Energy Storage North America in San Diego in August. So with that, I'll turn it on over to, to Warren and Sam and to all of you for questions. Hey, thanks very much, Lon. That was very interesting, and you won't be surprised to know that there are many questions that have come in. Let me first start with one that's sort of a, a foundational question. Is the idea of the Clean Peak Standard a substitute for a traditional RPS, or is it in addition to a traditional RPS and the utility and or electricity supplier would have to meet both the traditional RPS standard and a clean peak standard? Great. Yeah, that's a great question. Oh, and I wanted to mention that I am also joined for questions with the co-author in the paper, my colleague Ed Burgess. So uh, just wanted you, get, you guys to know that. But so going to that question, um, really it, it is in an it, it uses the foundation of the RPS, and there's natural synergies between the two. So it does; it certainly does not get rid of of the RPS, and it's an it's essentially a it can be an add-on. And so if you're again early on in your state's development, your RPS um, can you know, and again this gets into implementation implementation details, which can differ by state, but your RECs um, that you produce during those on-peak periods can also be those clean capacity credits, and you don't have to necessarily split them out and say, oh, I have to get a completely separate bucket. And so if, in, if early on in the RPS, your renewables line up really closely to peak, the utility, in, in terms of compliance, would obtain those RECs, and to the extent the, some of those RECs are right on that, that peak time period, they would also get the separate product in a sense of clean capacity credits. And so they would satisfy both standards with possibly the same uh, renewable facility. Okay. And, you know, given that some renewable mm -hmm. energy facilities don't line up all that well with peak, some do, what sorts of technologies and strategies do you envision meeting the peak Clean Peak standard beyond renewables plus storage? Well, beyond renewables and storage, that takes that takes a lot out um, because again, this is more of a renewable focused policy. But you could have demand side resources, right? So. Um, you know, think of energy efficiency measures with a high percentage of peak coincidence. So um, it could be uh, more efficient AC unit type of programs. It could be direct load control programs, for instance. Um, so there's, there's a lot of technologies on the customer side that are more load related um, that, that you could qualify. It just, it brings a little bit more complexity given the fact that some of those technologies aren't directly metered, so you'd have to ensure you know, stringent measurement and, and verification, which a lot of times is done anyway. Um, but I, I could see those resources uh, you know, helping um, and, and being able to, to qualify uh, for, for the CPS. Well, this is um, a little unfair because I just pushed you in the direction of complexity and making the um, Clean Peak mandate a little more complex, but we then have questions like this one who says this, you know, this idea sounds interesting, but how do you respond to the concern that this is going to be 
overly complex and there's going to be a high cost of implementing this, high cost of defining the metrics for measuring and sourcing, that could be tough as well. Um, how do you respond? Sure. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, and I went to, this is a little bit more of an advanced presentation than I normally give, but, um, but given the, you know, your audience, I, I think it's appropriate. And I wanted to give the full suite of options, but I don't want it to get lost that this can be as simple or complex as, as, as you want it to be. But, but really thinking about this is that we have to introduce a little bit more sophistication with our renewable policies, especially in states that already have high penetrations. And there's no way getting around the fact that there is going to be a little bit more work in terms of implementation for something like this because we're moving beyond just must take energy at, at any time and, and counting those wrecks to something more, something that 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 you know is is focused on on capacity and and in California's case, uh, flexible capacity. And and so with implementation it, it really can be as simple as we're gonna pick the same four hours you know, throughout the year, and we're going to ensure that there has to just, you have to just meet an average amount of renewables during those four hours and measured from your production meter. And, um, you know, as long as you uh, hit that average, then you're, you're completely fine over those hour blocks. Um, and, and I think in California, one of the bills calls for the top 20 days of a month and, the, and I think the top four hours, uh, you know, of those 20 days. And it's a simple averaging to make sure um, that the clean resources are actually there during that time period. So I think it can get as simple as, as, as complex depending on really what the state needs. And in California, I can envision it being a bit more complicated than Arizona because Arizona really isn't at that point where uh, flexible capacity needs are, are, are you know, hitting a, um, a point where they have to be addressed, where in Arizona it's really that peak summer and those hours don't move too much, so um, you'd have that four-hour spread and just look at the production meter. But there is no way getting around the fact that there will be a little bit more impl implementation costs. But the benefits, um, I think, far outweigh those implementation costs. And as, as we saw from that low carbon grid study, uh, ratepayers can save a lot of money when, when being a little bit more sophisticated with how you operate renewables and, and how you align them to system cost drivers. Okay, well, back on this issue of simplicity versus complexity, two of the listeners wrote in and asked you to react to two alternative approaches to addressing Arizona's dilemma and to see how you think these would compare to implementing the Clean Peak standard. One person said, would it be easier and better to just have more robust resource planning in Arizona? Um, would that be better than having a new mandate and a new standard? And someone else wrote in and said, you know, um, ice storage air conditioning could make a big difference in addressing peak load because the technology allows moving 90% of the air conditioning load to low cost hours. Why not just focus on that with incentives and then you don't have to do anything as complex as the clean peak standard. How do those two approaches compare to what you are proposing here? Sure. So on the ice storage standpoint, I think, I think that type of technology can easily fit within the Clean Peak standard framework, but I, I, I think we have to be careful of just picking winners and losers uh, for technology. And so in that type of scenario, you'd say, okay, well, we want to do this one type of technology or technology suite, and we're going to give incentives. What the Clean Peak standard does, it sets a more holistic framework where the best sort of technologies compete, and, and, you, and, and we envision a tradable system just like REC. So um, we don't want to make any calls of where technology is going to go. Obviously, everybody knows it's progressing fast. So if ice storage connected to residential homes is the most cost-effective way to do things, then that will be that resource chosen within the CPS framework. But if it isn't, then maybe it's a type of within the distribution system, uh, utility solar plus batteries, right? We, we just don't know. And so I think there's a risk there 
where you want to really just set up a framework where the best technology at the lowest price wins. So that's that's my one answer to that one. And then on the IRP discussion or the planning discussion, well, if we just have, have better planning, you know, this you can lead to this. And I do think that there's there's certainly merit to that. Um, but you know, at the same time, I'd argue that that these these forums sometimes are um, are it's it's sort of you don't really make resource decisions within in these planning. You run some scenarios and maybe you have some near-term action plans, but um, there's a reason why, you know, and, and Warren, I think you probably know the numbers better than me, but dozens upon dozens of states have renewable energy standards or renewable portfolio standards, right? It wasn't, you could have done that through a planning process as well, but there needed to be a little bit of, of something extra there to really focus the, the, the state and, and the utilities to, to do something new. Um, and to and to drive uh, renewable adoption and, and and really promote resource diversification and um, and sometimes the IRP process or the planning process can miss certain things and and the the cost forecasting can be off or the political will just isn't there in that type of forum. So I, I'm not ruling that type of, of setting out by any means, but I would point if if. Better resource planning was the answer. Then we wouldn't need RPSs in all the states. We have RPSs. Thank you. Well, a couple people asked if you could go back to slides 18 and 19 and go over again how compliance would be determined. And while you were Sam, get back to these those slides. I have a true confession to make to everybody on the phone. I am the typical provincial um, northeastern person, and I got my western states confused when I mentioned Nevada at the beginning of the hour. I meant to say that it was Arizona and California that are the two states consider considering this um, Clean Peak standard at the moment. Um, please excuse my um, extreme provinciality. So if you could go over, again, how you would determine compliance. Sure. So you would set your time frame based on that net load peak, which, so you can see this gray line, which is basically the, the you know, system load curve with, without renewables, okay? And the, the blue line is uh, after renewables. And, and so you would set it at where that new blue line peak is. That would be your hour time frame. However, at, in terms of compliance, you would compare it to, to that gross um, load in the gray bars above that blue peak. And so that way you're not, um, you know, you're, you're counting those existing renewable resources that are already there and you're avoiding any double counting issues. And again, you're focusing on what the new system peak is um, that that you have to design your system to meet. So that that is um, uh, an illustration there of, of just sort of how you set that that compliance window, and then what you judge your say if it's forty percent target, how you judge your if you've gotten forty percent over that time period. Okay. And maybe go to the next slide as well. Yeah, to, to explain yeah. this again. Um, so uh, this, is, this is really just responding to, well, if your policy is successful, you're actually going to see some movement in your, your peak window, right? And what you want to do is you want to make sure that it, to the extent that your um, your uh, peak hours or your your net load peak move, you don't want to have a situation where um, you say, okay, well we've got one that that we've got a new net load peak that shifted completely out of our four hours, and now we've got to we've got to respond to that, and then you shift your entire standard and you forget about those original four hours. Say, and this is a pretty extreme example because. Typically, you won't see that, that net load peak move by 
by that many hours, it's going to most likely remain somewhere in that four-hour window. But let's just say you've got a state that's that really starting from scratch with renewables, there could definitely be some shifting. Um, what this this essentially says is, well, hey, you know, you maintain that this that original hour block because you want to avoid any type of snapback that occurs if you move focus to another set of hours. Okay, and one person um, saw the virtue of the Queen Peak standard for a small system, but wondered how you'd apply this concept to a large system like PJM with diverse load patterns in different places. Could it be applied there? Well, I, I guess I would just go back to um, the fact that certain states within PJM have specific renewable energy portfolio standards, and they make it work within the, the larger context. Now, um, I, I think basically what you would have is you'd, you'd have, you know, you could have a type of regional trading system in theory, but to the, to the you know, listener's point, you've got, you, put, you have potentially different um, windows in, in terms of, of peak demand. But really for certain larger systems, uh, in, in terms of overall system peak, there once you, you aggregate everything into uh, into a large type of footprint, like think of MISO or PJM, you you have really one almost system-wide peak that doesn't move that often. So um, you can really target in on that that initial time period. But to the to the you know the listener's point, you might have some local capacity. Um, uh, time periods that might not completely align to that system peak and it could be driving maybe distribution system upgrades or or something else and so in that case you would have maybe a local type of multiplier um, but still within a regional trading system that's focused on the regional peak um, that that could drive capacity additions for for the ISO or um, for that regional organization. So that's that's how I, I would think of that, and I wouldn't think that it, it would deviate too far from from state renewable energy standards where there's specific, um, there could be specific carve-outs within those state RPSs. Do you see a Queen Peak standard potentially influencing what um, energy storage systems get deployed? In other words, if we start moving in this direction, will there be some energy storage technologies that become more attractive than they would be otherwise because they match up well with Clean Peak standard implementation and some other energy storage technologies that maybe provide different types of ancillary services would not get as much attention? Yeah, that's a really that's a really good question. Um, so you know, just as I thought about it, and, and we're engaging uh, Duke to do a study around this, but um, where I see the initial most cost effective form of, of storage is actually on retrofits of existing renewables on that on a DC coupled basis, um, because again, those those renewables get the ITC. And the duration of, of those store uh, and the storage and renewables get the ITC, and, and the duration of that storage, to me, is partly dependent on on the renewable resource, but also you know the the CPS window. And as I said, some states might have a longer than four hours, but you you know this is probably more of a type of I would say maybe a lithium ion or or even maybe a, a solar thermal play in in essence with with storage, but um, I think you you might be missing a little bit of the benefits of long duration storage, depending on how you set this up, and then you might be missing a little bit of the um, the short term, say, ancillary services value um, from from certain type certain technologies. But when you couple it with renewables, you're you're having access to um, to also the inverters from the renewable facility that can do a lot with 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 our, you know, the, the wind or the solar, um, more and more capabilities are, are being um, are being utilized there. In fact, I, th I think First Solar came out with a, I think it was a joint report with NREL, 
or the IS or the California ISO, where um, just a, a solar only installation can provide a significant amount of, of ancillary services than, than previously thought. So, so I, I guess it, it, that's a long-winded way to say it, it really depends on your compliance window and how you couple, if at all, this, the storage. But I think from my standpoint, it's a little bit too early to tell and, and, and what would receive the benefit. And again, that's the reason why to, we're sort of thinking of having this a tradable system where just the most cost-effective technology to meet that peak window wins. Well, with, focusing on that issue of a tradable system, um, if you have a tradable system with tradable racks, does that make sense if what you're really looking for is location-specific solutions? Don't you want to restrict trading in some regards? Well, I, I think, yeah, I mean, well, it, so there's there's differences where if you've got a, a really important local capacity need, you're going, you know, just like how some states have specific carve-outs for DG or certain SREC components, some states actually even have multipliers for some in-state uh, produced renewables, right? And so, uh, in, in terms of the technology. so. It, it depends. You might have a broader system-wide tradable system, but within that, you you may have a location-specific multiplier for clean capacity credits if the the uh, resources are sited within um, a specific congestion zone, for instance. Okay. Let me ask another um, technology-specific question whether you could envision this as fitting into a clean peak standard or not. Um, say you're in a location where there's um, hydro resources, pumped hydro storage that's traditionally used in midday, and if that was transitioned for use in the end of the day peak, could you envision something like that as qualifying for the clean peak uh, standard concept? Huh, this is is this a little bit of a tricky subject because as I think as as you know some states count hydro some states don't and in terms of their RPS so this is a, a really a state level implementation question unique to that to the state but I I wouldn't see why not especially if you can shift what would normally occur midday um, to peak time framing you know in in the hydro side of things I think. Um, I, I think that could certainly count towards the, the CPS, but again, I don't want to make anything definitive because um, there are some states that do not include hydro or they include small hydro and not larger, so um, it's up to the individual state, but it, from a ratepayer standpoint, you're, you're getting to the same type of, of outcome where you're reducing your, you know, your peak demand on your, on your system. Well, I'm going to give you a uh, moment to for some final thoughts, but before I do that, I want to um, apologize to the folks who wrote in questions that I haven't been able to get to. As we have learned, this is a topic with great interest and it raises lots of questions. Um, I want to thank everybody who's listened and who's um, taking the time to write in questions, even if we didn't get to all of yours. And I want to thank you, Lon, for participating and opening up this topic for us. In the last minute, do you have any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Well, I yeah, I, I want just folks to to think, you know, as they're in, in their day to day and thinking, you know, creatively on, on new policies or ways to do things to just to keep this idea in mind, and not necessarily how I structured this here, because again, the concept of aligning low-cost renewable energy to, to peak um, system needs is is one that I think we should all be be thinking about now. That we've we've had a little bit of a paradigm shift where renewable energy used to be far above market, and that's not the case anymore. And so, how can we leverage that to maximize value to ratepayers? And instead of maybe just continually to increase an RPS from 50 to 75 to 100, maybe there's another way or a, uh, another um, type of focus that we can build into that type of structure that 
can save ratepayers uh, a significant amount of money going forward. So um, I, I want just everyone to just keep that type of policy direction in mind. Um, and then again, if you have any questions, uh, you know, read this white paper. I think it'll it'll cover a lot of, of things. And then feel free to email me as well. Um, and uh, which and, and you can find my email address on the website. Sorry, I didn't include it here, but um, visit the Stratagen website um, or from the Energy Storage North America, and and uh, I can give you a discount code if you're interested there too. But other than that, thank you so much for your time. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share this concept with everyone. And thank you, and I look forward to hearing from many of you on future webinars. So um, we'll be back in touch. Bye now. Great. Take care.